legends of the comic book industry. Well, one legend, one freelancer. <laughs> one out of work old man. <laughs> Thank goodness for comic conventions. <clears throat> so. Don't, don't everybody speak at once. <laughs> Um, you've worked on a lot of DC projects. How did you end up getting into working on comics? Oh, I was uh, a very naive young high school kid who grew up a very, very naive young man and fell in love with him back in 63. You know, so by the time I got out of high school, it was what I wanted to do and uh, won a contest and uh, was hired by DC Comics, so worked on staff. That was like 1973, 74. So your first work for DC was in 73? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the year before I started reading comics? Uh, yeah. so I was seven. <laughs> That's 50 years ago. Yeah. That's a long yeah. career. Yeah, yeah. A long Not... career of naivete. Uh, still. Yeah, yeah, sure. Still. So, I... Uh, I don't know how you feel about it, but I think being an artist is a curse. Hmm. Okay. You sound I mean, like it's, James O'Barr. It's a blessing. It's a blessing, but if I don't, if I'm not drawing, I'm not happy. You mm. know what I mean? So mm -hmm. by that, mm -hmm. it's a, it's an yeah. addiction. Let me put it yeah, I know way. what you mean. Yeah. Well, it's an addiction that you can get paid for, so that's a good thing, I guess. But yeah, if a few days go by and I haven't done anything in the studio, I start to feel really... Yeah. Yeah. Weird and anxious yeah. and uh, yeah. like I'm doing something wrong. You know, like I, yeah, it's very, it's, well, the thing is, is if you, you have to have that internal, um, there's that boss that's in here who tells you to go to work because no one else is telling you to go to work, you know? So that internal boss is pushing you to do the work. But at the same time, when you finally get in the chair, yeah. You feel comfortable. How old are you, Dan? Fifty-seven. Okay. Uh, who have you got watching your table right now? Who? My sons. Okay. You've got a boss. Okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, you're a family man. That's well, your boss. Before I had, before I had that, I, I think w the main motivator was not wanting to let anyone down. Mm -hmm. You wanted mm -hmm. to make your editors happy. You wanted to make the people who were paying you happy. And you wanted to show them that you were worthy of securing the, it next month. The work. job. Yeah. 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 I remember early on when I got my first solid money gigs with uh, Eclipse. And I was working on this book called The Black Terror. And I was still in art school. It was in my last semester of art school when I was working on I started working on it. And it was about three or four months later, I got tapped by uh, DC to work on a creator-owned property with this writer who was looking for somebody, James Hudnall. Do you remember James Hudnall? Mm -hmm. And um, so I was hired to do the Psycho while I was still working in the Black Terror. And then for like the next, most of a decade, that's kind of how it was. I had something set up in advance. Mm -hmm. And so there was never this feeling of like, what am I going to do? Where's the money going to come after this job's over? You know, that was all art school. Art was, our school was like, how am I going to pay for my student loan? Am I going to be good enough? Is anyone going to want to hire me? You know? And, but once I started rolling and people wanted to hire me, I just, that, that part of it was kind of over for a while until the early 2000s set in and things changed again. Mm -hmm. But yeah. yeah, I was just busy all the time. And you, you, and it, when you work for DC, Pat, I'm sure that you can relate. You have a quota of pages you have to fill. And whether you're working for Marvel or DC, you have a quota of pages you have to do for that month in order to get paid. And so there's a lot of hand to mouth, month to month thinking. And if you spend two or three days away from the drawing board, the clock is ticking, mm -hmm. you know, and your bank account is waiting. So, and the bills are waiting, you know, yeah, yeah. that doesn't really go away. I don't think. Stress-free life. Stress-free. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's another thing, too, is there's all these perks that came of it, because I wouldn't have met you if I wasn't in comics. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have even... The first time I ever got on an airplane was to go to San Diego when I was in my last year of art school. And I'd already done one job for Eclipse Comics. Did you work for... Did you do work for Eclipse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did. I did. Um, 
so it's brought a lot of riches to my life and um which i'm very grateful for i met my wife there you know um it's just crazy how much uh just being a comic book fan as a little kid has taken me on this journey yeah it's amazing and this and it sounds like the same thing for you so 1963 you were were you in high school when when marvel comics started doing superhero comics or were you like well young you were younger than that yeah i was in uh let me see i was born in 53 okay so i was you were like the perfect age yeah yeah for jack yeah. kirby and Stan Lee. Issue one of X-Men. Wow. Look. So issue one of X-Men was the thing that snared you into superhero comics and made you start dreaming about it. It, it introduced me to Marvel. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then their ads introduced me to right. Avengers, Hulk. And yeah. That. One thing I've, I've talked to other people about who read comics from this, a young age, particularly Marvel comics, is that Marvel created a universe and, the, and, a, and an idea of an alternate reality before we had any concept of that, like as children. I mean, we had mm. TV. Some of us got to go to the movies. Some of us liked to go to the library and read books. And then we had this alternate reality we could escape into called Marvel Comics. Because, because of Stan and the people that were, he was hiring and working with, like Jack, yeah. they created a world Steve. that we could escape into. We mm -hmm. can escape into. And it was very, it, it lived and breathed in a way that a lot of other comic book, you couldn't say that about all those other comics. You couldn't necessarily say it about DC at the time. You know, yeah, you, it, it was connected. It felt real, yeah, felt yeah, like a place. It's the uh, suspension of reality. That's what uh, storytelling's about, whether you're writing, video, whatever, you know. And, uh, I think it's because we're probably both very visual, you know. Yeah. We could see things quickly that we would read. Yeah. yeah. I think that was one of the people call it when an artist is really good and he grabs you visually, they, the term eye candy comes to mind and it's a great way of putting it. Mm -hmm. When you like an, a certain artist's work, there's eye candy there that grabs you. And Jack Kirby had all kinds of eye candy and everyone else who was working at you know, in, in comics that Dick pulled me in, Gene Colan, John Buscema, Gil Kane. Kubert, Joe Kubert. Co Joe, I, I discovered Joe, Joe, I remember seeing Joe Kubert's covers and going, that guy looks like he should be working for Marvel. Because <laughs> it was very different from anything else that DC was doing. But at the same time, it was very DC because that's, that's, you know, that's who he was working for. But yeah, that stuff just sucked you right in. And um, I remember the first time I saw your work, it was very... It was one of those times where you can, like, your your work is instantly recognizable for your style. And um, I think that's always a, it's a double-edged sword. It's mostly a good thing for an artist, you know, to develop this sort of visual style that becomes your trademark. But you have to make sure that the fans and the editors and the people hiring you are still on board with it. Because I've, I've had that encountered the same thing where it's a double-edged sword, yeah. you know. Even Frazetta was considered a dated looking at a certain point in his career before he started doing the paperback covers. Yeah. 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 House styles can uh, <clears throat> sustain you for a long time until those styles change. Did you feel like you were part of a house style at the time you were doing comics? No. No. Did you ever get a sense that you were inspiring or that you were inspiring other artists that, to draw based on what they were learning from you as... I See, was just mostly concerned, Dan, with uh, telling a clear, clean story. Okay. Yeah. You know, um, I knew that the people followed it, of course. Yeah. You know, but to me, it was always being able to uh, make the writer happy, make the reader happy. Mm. You know, uh, and you can see through the history of my stuff, it's developed over the years. Sure. You know, so. Yeah. Uh, really enjoying what I'm doing today more than anything I've done probably 40 years. Do you, do you feel like you have more freedom now to do what you want to do? I'm drawing Social Security. 
course. Yeah. No, but but it, yeah. but like you know, when you got into comics, it was like, wow, it's like a dream come true. I get to do this and do that, and it's exciting. But that was ego. But you get over that after a while, and then it's yeah, like well, first time I fail. Do you comics? <laughs> did you find that you were turning down work? Did you find that you were taking work because it was work, and then ever getting to a point where you turned down the work because you didn't want to do it? Uh, I had to turn down work because I had to draw a line and not allow them to force work on me, mm -hmm. okay, because they would do that at times because uh, uh, titles would get in trouble. And the trouble they would get into would be uh, maybe the original uh, creative team left it because it wasn't selling as well as they liked. Mm -hmm. They were saying their royalty checks, okay? And they would have contracts with the printers mm -hmm. to get these books there by a certain day. Right. And so a couple of times they gave me like a week to do a book. You know, and I already had commitments for that month, but they called up and told me I had to take that book. Mm -hmm. And they put really hard pressure on it. Who was your, who was your editor at the time? Uh, Did you Andy have this? Helfer or Kevin Dooley or... Uh, Helfer. Sorry. Denny O'Neill. Okay. Yeah, he worked with some good people. But um, I can see how that would be really tough because you were also someone who probably made your deadlines, uh, and that was part of your reputation, so you yeah. can make a yeah. deadline. Yeah. That's very important. Editors love that when you yeah. make your deadlines. <laughs> so, uh, that was one of the things that I heard when I was, uh, when I was uh, doing moderating another panel with, my God, I can't remember which editor it was, but he was to like... The reason some of these artists got big is literally just because we kept giving them work because they made deadlines. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's people who work very steadily because of that. They're very, there's, they're reliable. They're, there's no headache. There's no mysteries. There's no drama. Yeah. And they, and they, and they do the job that they're supposed to do. They deliver. Yeah. 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 I only screamed back like maybe three times in my mm -hmm. 50 some odd years. You know, it's like, just, just no. Well, they put you in a position where, you don't really want to argue too much. Yeah. You're so replaceable. There's no benefits. There's no job security mm -hmm. whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's like you said, it's naive. You're naive when you go in because it's like a dream come true. But all these other things like security and yeah. retirement and benefits, they don't even enter into it because you're just, you're like, wow, I get to do this. They're letting me, they're letting me do this and they're paying me to do it. I would do it for free. Yeah. But uh, then there's all these other things you miss out on. And yeah. then later on in life, people are like, don't you have this? Don't you have that? It's like, uh, no, I don't have those things. Yeah. You know, but I am going to Europe. Yeah. I am yeah. getting flown to Europe to a convention. Oh, that yeah. sounds cool. Do you have a retirement plan? What's that? How, where do I get that? I am going to <laughs> Europe. For <laughs> That's my retirement That's plan. Right. I will be making money in Europe. Yeah. yeah. No, I've, yes. I've had... Uh, three careers in three different industries during this time you now because of like the uh crash in the 90s can we hear you oh i'm sorry the crash the crash in the 90s oh right know? the comic crash right and yeah. then uh that i dabbled in advertising storyboards and stuff for a while and uh made contacts in tampa from the agencies there and and advertising uh, you, uh, you promote up, but it's also you transfer from one agency to another agency in that city or in a different region, okay? Mm -hmm. So I had uh, c creative directors that left Tampa, went to Dallas, and uh, hooked up with uh, Tracy Locke in partnership who handled Pepsi, Frito-Lay, and mm. so they hired me out there, and then I worked in Tracy Locke for two and a half years. Mm. And then I um, was hired by college back in Tampa to teach. So I took that because I didn't like drinking every night mm -hmm. in advertising. Mm -hmm. did, they did way too much drinking. Yeah. And um, started teaching. I ended up teaching for 15 years. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. And then, Wait, where did you teach? Uh, what state? At the, what state? This was in Florida. Florida, okay. Yeah, state yeah, of Florida. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, also, I 
little bit of animation, Jimmy Neutron, Boy Genius. Mm. And uh, that was it. Then uh, teaching. And here's some advice. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, I'm Social Security now. Your Social Security is based on your last 10 years. No kidding. Huh? Yeah. That's, That's one kind of, of the things they change. So when you're telling your sons, yeah, you know, they take it out, but you're going to get it back when they're 18. Mm -hmm. They're not going to see that. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's based on your employment during the last 10 years. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of which, these two guys are also teachers. Ah, uh, well, I yeah, it was a shock. It was a truly a shock, you know, because it's like it didn't even go beyond my teaching years. And it's like, wait a mm. minute, what about the advertising years and the years I had mm -hmm. my corporation? I paid. I said, no, no, it's just the you last. pay in, but we calculate on your last ten years. Your oh, best of those years. Huh. Yeah. Good to know. And I waited and waited I, to uh, get the full benefits instead of uh, at 65. Partial. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So full benefits come in what age? 67. 67? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. I meant 200 bucks a month more, but it's 200 bucks a month more, you know? Yeah. When I meet people who are younger today who want to get into comics, the first thing I say is think about animation. Yeah. yeah, because you can do a lot of the same things in animation that you that you want to do in comics, but there's a hell. They first of all they have a union. Yeah, we'll never have a union in our lifetimes. I'm sure. Um, there's benefits. There's better pay. There's better treatment. You know, I mean, sometimes it's not always, as James knows, uh, full steady employment. And I even worked in animation for a little bit. I remember they set me up with a 401k that was over like at the end of the summer when my job was over, but at least I had one for a small amount of time. Never was what offered. What show a... did you work on? Um, I, I developed a pilot and a Bible for a pilot for Disney TV animation. So it never went to pilot, but I learned all about how that stuff works. And this was in 2005. And at the same time I was working on a, a graphic novel for uh, Disney uh, Talia uh, comic publishing and uh, yeah so I worked on a pitched a couple things to Disney TV and they I started they said oh we like this this and this so start with one and so I started with one and and then um, developed artwork and wrote a bible and um, with a writer a TV animation writer friend of mine we wrote the first pilot script and, and then it goes into the running with eight or nine other shows and then I think three get picked and then one goes to pilot I think something like that and the thing that they picked that went to pilot and got on the air was atrocious and I remember looking at this going we busted our asses to make something really cool and this is what they picked this garbage mm -hmm. but you know and the funny thing is with the, with with at the time Disney was kicking themselves for not picking up Avatar you know the animated avatar or spongebob they had they had passed on spongebob so this thing that they picked up was more in the in the the realm of spongebob but spongebob is a is the exception that proves the rule it's not the you know what i'm saying it's mm -hmm. it's not it, you don't go with something because it seems like it it's spongebob and that might make it a hit that was ridiculous um but i learned a lot working for them and i it, it paid well um there, once a week, there was a, a phone conference with three different executives. One of them was in England, so I had to get up really early. It was the end of this guy's day. And, um, and yeah, so we had to have these story conferences. But uh, And then when it came time to pitch the idea, none of those people were in the room. It was up, left to a different person. It was a very, very weird situation. The whole thing is very strange. But the idea of getting a show on TV was like... When you have gold fever, you know, when you're like a minor 49er and you're yeah. working your gold claim, yeah. you just, you know, you just, you know, it's there stars in your eyes. And yeah, yeah, you, you can, I can almost know. get my hands on it. But uh, the one thing I loved about comics when comics wasn't, um, like you said before, the implosion of the mid 90s was this feeling that anything, any idea that you had, you could pitch it. And they, if they said yes to it, then you could do it. Mm -hmm. And then you were off and running your own universe. So when I first got Nocturnals um, approved, um, 
and I started working on it, I was like, wow, this is like, I felt like my career was really starting. So this was like 93, 94, and I've been doing comics for a few years, but I felt like I really stepped into where I was, the direction that I was supposed to be going with comics, where you come up with an idea, someone says yes, they front the money, and then you go off and do it. And and then that all changed a couple of years later. But uh, I did get to do some some cool creator-owned stuff with uh, a few publishers in the 90s that um, would have been a lot harder in the next decade, impossible in the next decade, especially to get paid for it. So, actually, I have a question actually regarding animation and comics. So, one of the things that happens that I'm, I always, I always love about comics is good panel work. Yeah. You know, because good panel work can express a story very effectively. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Whereas in animation, you have a locked frame in sort of a way. You, yeah. you can do motion, but you yeah. have a locked, uh, a locked like. Yeah, size. you're in that. You're in that TV mode, or you're the you, widescreen mode. The would box. You say that that's more akin to like the old like Jack Kirby four panel uh, spreads that he used to do. Well, I don't know because Jack would he would vary between like six or sometimes what nine panel grids, right? To then like just a few for depending on in full pages then. Yeah. depending on the action what was going on what I found is I got really into um, screenplays and watching film and stuff in the 90s and uh, that stuff was so influential and in how can it not be when you're working visually but one thing that I found was when I was doing my own layouts for a story I really wanted to have that widescreen look mm-hmm. and so I would try and go widescreen as long as I could and then invariably doesn't really work here. I need some more space. I got to put some people in there. And that's when I'm writing my own stuff. Because usually the writer will come in and he wants six panels or seven panels or whatever, you know. And sometimes you get someone who's like working with Walt Simonson was cool because he knew not to give me more than like five or six per page. Because mm-hmm. he wanted me to be able to open up with a painted art. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I um, so I always try and do like a three, like a page of like three to four widescreen shots. And then occasionally you'll have to, you'll have to go in and put in some, some close-ups. So then you're or or a uh, establishing shot like if you want to show something like a a tall building or a street you know a city I'll I'll usually turn it so it's vertical rather than horizontal mm-hmm. and so then the fact that I can vary that and I'm not stuck in that wide screen thing is cool mm-hmm. but I try and stick with it as much as I can until it's time to not stick with it if that makes sense mm-hmm. I don't know what do you think I love the widescreen look. Uh, <clears throat> the rules in uh, cinema and animation uh, cover comics too. So sure. it's really nice to be able to uh, plot a page out where you, you don't, you find you, you don't cross your line of action finally, you know? And there's room in the panels for balloons, mm-hmm. you know, because you're following that format. Yeah. You know, and that was always my big um, challenge was making sure there was enough yeah, room. Yeah, yeah, for the damn balloons. Um, it just um, this western I'm doing right now. I've got a lot of wide screen shots and low angle wide screen shots from ground level up because western towns look really nice that way. Mm-hmm. You know? So you learn to move your camera. Yeah, yeah, in, yeah up yeah. and down, and yeah, yeah, yeah. rather than than. Because you can't move the frame, yeah, yeah. so you have to move the camera. And the <clears throat> problem, the only problem I've seen with comics is uh, some artists get into the uh, trap of uh, cross-cutting their action. Explain what what that means. Well, if you're illustrating an action going this way, you can't have an action coming this way in the next scene because it cross-cuts. Right. Yeah. You know? The eye is always going yeah. the direction that we read. Yeah. So in American comics, yeah. in American comics. You're starting up, I'm, I'm facing you guys, not yeah. me. You're starting up here and you're going this way, right? Yeah. Just like when you read. So the action kind of follows that way too. Yeah. You don't want to go, you don't want to reverse it. Sometimes it's the way, which way is the figure facing? You know, sometimes the figure is not facing that way. It's the other, it's the other way. Yeah. But you don't yeah. want to cross cut too much. The only way that you make that work is by in, inserting a long shot right in between the two. And okay. Showing them both so that it uh, right. transits to the next car. Right. Yeah. There's all these little things yeah. that yeah. you have to watch out for. Like one thing that really makes you crazy is the Janus effect, which is when you have two panels, right? 
and then you have a person whose profile is coming out of one border, but then the next panel, another person's profile is coming out of the same border on the other side. So it's like this two-headed monster bisected by a, a border, and it's really bad design. And your 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 eye stops dead on it, and it doesn't want to move. So you're you're always trying to move the 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 reader's eye, and so you try not to do things that will stop you dead in your tracks. Like you don't put you don't draw like an object behind someone's head that's touching their head. So like, let's say I'm standing here, there's a sign behind my, yeah, bad design tangents, like the corner of a sign touching my skull. They're not really touching, it's back here, but because of the way it's been drawn, and your eye gets stuck there, yeah. and you don't even know your eye is stuck yeah. there half the time. You're, 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 it just interrupts the rhythm. So you always wanna move things around, overlap, get it out of the way. Don't let, you don't want lines that are parallel to each other or, or aping each other, like, the line of a guy, like if a guy's elbow is going like this, you don't want something else is doing this over here. You, you want it, you, in other words, the brain is always trying to create symmetry in design. It's always trying to put everything in the center. It's always trying to make everything analogous and the same because it loves pattern. But what your job as an illustrator is to take that and subvert it and, and make it asymmetrical, but in a way that works from a design point of view. So you have to really watch your tangents very much like in film, the rule, the 180 rule. You yeah. try to not break the 180 rule. Yeah. Because the that rule of it. thirds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the rule of thirds is for drawing basic drawing, period. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know. Yeah. My students, I can give them the sheet of the rule of thirds and tell them to identify the uh, points of uh, design. Okay, so you have to explain what the rule of thirds is. Okay. Tic-tac-toe across the sheet, a blank sheet. You know, but when you hand that out and you, you tell the students, okay, identify the points of design, okay? They fill it with X's and O's. They hand it in. They don't know what, I said, no, no, no. Where the lines cross are the points of design for each third of that blank space, vertically and horizontally. So. You know, but they hand me that back in, and it, you know, it's like, oh, man. <laughs> you know, how do I do this? I got to nail it down hard. It's like, yeah, my understanding of that? it came a little more. Yeah. No one ever explained the rule of thirst to me, but I understand the concept yeah, because of yeah. other ways that I was taught. Yeah, yeah. And also just when you look at um, when you look at certain artists long enough, like for Frank Rosetta was a master of composition. He worked yeah. everything out in little and his comp his comps, which yeah. that's what they call them in illustration. They call them a comp, which stands for comprehensive. And when you have a job as a mainstream illustrator, they want to see a comp. Sometimes it's a black and white comp or it's a color oh. comp to show them what you're going to do in the finish. Yeah. And then they can say yes, no, yes, no, change that, and then you go and you do the finish. In comics, there's not always a comp involved. They usually they trust you to, or you'll send in some 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 roughs. You know, and they'll usually pick the one you like the least. <laughs> or they'll ask or they'll ask for four more. <laughs> yeah. So um the trick is don't give them any at first. Just yeah. try and get away with not sending them anything um and see what they do. But the the idea is that um an artist like Frazetta who's trained who came up in that world of, of you know, art directors, um would work these things out ahead of time for a larger painting um, and make sure everything is working compositionally so that when you look at it, it all flows and it all works as a unit. Mm -hmm. And that's really important because artists, there are lots of artists who don't work that way. They just start drawing. And maybe they have an intuitive sense of design. Some of them do, some of them don't. But I think it's really important to work that out. Once you start realizing that that's important, it, your work improves. You know, and then you find yourself doing a balancing act. Even when you mm -hmm. just draw a figure yeah. in the center, you still want to do things to balance it. Yeah. Which is why I'm always putting moons and everything, or bats, or whatever little things I, to I, balance. I try to curve. stay away from dead center at all costs. Yeah, you always want you it know? to be, you know. Yeah. 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 And again, even with a single piece, if it's a pinup or a cover or whatever it is, your eye still is roving around that composition. So you want to keep it moving in the in a circular way, you know, and not get stuck somewhere down the bottom or up in the corner or something. Yeah, it's like when I took photography classes and I mentioned how all, all phones do it. You can do, do the uh, grid mm. and you can mm -hmm. actually like see mm -hmm. and yeah. so pausing you're taking photos and saying, what, why does this appeal to me or why does this not appeal to yeah. me? Is it right. Yeah. Start learning it? Yeah. yeah, for sure. You know, it's fascinating. I actually really enjoy that part of things. 
especially when I'm doing layouts. Because when I do layouts, I do them very quickly. They're just for me. Um, and everything's just big shapes and little shapes. And where do you put them? You know, um, one thing I like to do is go back and look at like Kurosawa films, like uh, especially Seven Samurai, because the way he composes his shots are just amazing. And they're so simple, you know. But when he had seven people on the screen, he knew where to put them. And he did it in a way that was that made you wish you could put seven people on the screen all the time, you know, which is not always easy. He made it look easy. Uh, Columbo recently yeah. and the framing in Columbo was really good because you could scale the background the characters doing their bi stage business. Right. And you can, but you know where the focus is always. Yeah. It always is interesting to me when you're watching a film and at first it's not quite apparent where the you're supposed to go. But if you just stop thinking about it, your eye will go there because if someone, a good cinematographer will already lead you into it for sure. Yeah. So that stuff actually makes me happy when the design is working, um, when I can see how a design is working in another person's work, as opposed to trying to struggle through just looking at a piece of artwork, which actually ha does happen. So. Do you want to have anything to add to that, sir? For Warren Publications. The only thing Warren ever published of uh, my work was uh, two pieces of fan art that I sent in. That was all. Yeah. What? Yeah. What? Uh, what? Do you know what titles that they were? Oh. Creepy, eerie, vampy. I'm thinking eerie. So you were a teenager. Oh yeah, I was in probably. Was this uh, early on? House. Eleventh grade, high school. When did creepy first start? Sixty two, sixty four. Yeah. Did it come? Did 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 the Warren magazines start coming out before Marvel went to superheroes? No. Because no. you had... uh, well, it, there is Warren Publishing, which he published a lot of stuff. Um, photo. Famous monsters. Yeah, it was one photo of the first stuff. ones. So. Fifty-seven. Yeah. Okay. So but, creepy number one was six, early sixties. I know. I think early mid sixties because I know I was at least then. I had to be in high school or the end of junior high, you know, like ninth grade, tenth grade. Yeah, I remember the uh, Frazetta Conan covers hitting mm -hmm. the first time. Mm -hmm. You know, so that would put it at that time period. Okay. Yeah. You know, were you um, Ace Publishing? Were you so you were you found you got inspired by the Warren guys and by Frazetta and. Well, I was already a huge Ditko nerd from yeah. the first yeah. issue of Spider-Man on. And when you got into comics in 73, you had, like, the studio guys were already kind of known. You, had, you know, Barry Smith, Jeff Jones, oh, yeah. Wrights and Kaluta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, it's a good time to come up in comics. Oh, well, it was. Uh, well, at Continuity, it was uh, Neil, Ralph Reese, Dick Giordano, Jack Abel, Larry Hama... Russ Heath and um, yeah. yeah 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 it was a great time and the crusty bunkers like 18 and breaking in it was a great time so you were living where when this is all going on in the early 70s um let me see Brooklyn okay so you're in New York like yeah house. yeah I was living so in you Brooklyn. you hit the streets and you visited the different places to show your portfolio and all that stuff no they hired me from my uh, contest that was being held on the oh, July right. 4th. You said, yeah. So July Fourth convention. Bill Sulings, Commodore. And there was an July art. 4th. And what, what did you do for the art contest? Got in line. <laughs> it. Uh, well, you turn in like just a single piece. Well, I brought no. I brought a portfolio. Oh, you, okay. Like five or six pieces. So there. the contest was to show your portfolio or samples of your work and get a job doing comics. Get a yeah a tryout know, job to be hired into their junior bullpen. And that was DC. Yeah, it was Junior DC. Bullpen. Yeah, yeah. I used to write letters to the Bullpen in the early seventies, yeah. thinking they all worked together in a room, which they did not. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I think it will. Well, the Bullpen idea was around before, but when people could just send stuff in, you know, they didn't all have to work. I mean, when 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 Will Eisner was drawing the Spirit, he had a bunch of guys working under him, including yeah. Jack Kirby. Yeah, yeah. And same thing with uh, Kirby and. Uh, Oh, who was it he worked with? When they came, 
worked for Marvel back in the 40s with Captain America. Oh, just him and Joe Simon? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bullpen, you had bullpens in the 40s and yeah. 50s, but not so much the 60s. Now, were those guys who are speaking of the four guys on there, were they like ghosts? Were they ghost panels for Kirby, or what was... Oh, um, you're talking about Joe Simon and Jack Kirby working together? Yeah. In at the offices of Timely? No, the, when they had their studio. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did do you know that they had they had many assistants that, that worked uh, with them? I know names have been mentioned uh, who were pretty well known. Uh, in the, I think Marty Nodell worked up there. Oh, no kidding! Um, who created the Green Lantern? Yeah. The original Green Lantern. <clears throat> he used to call him and his wife Carrie my convention grandparents yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah they were yeah mm -hmm. thank you too for for your time I want to thank you and I thank you all for like just yeah we just got we just got warmed up <laughs> well since you're already warmed up please go visit them at their booths talk yeah. uh, talk shop talk comics thanks Get for coming yeah. thank you Ronald for coming thank you for and thank you so much gentlemen yeah, is there anything else we're saying? Dan Crozen? Grab a bottle of water, too. All right, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm.